Uh, I am Nikhil uh, Rana. I am from Google Cloud, and I have my friend Joinal Ahmed. Uh, so we are we're going to be talking about uh, LLM's edge deployment with uh, Wasm and uh, Web GPU. Uh, so just a disclaimer: this session, I think, uh, was supposed to be part of AI Dev. I think we submitted in the wrong category. So apologies for that. Uh, so to start off, uh, I think if you haven't been reminded about this million times, uh, yeah, this is where we are with respect to large language models. Uh, so yeah, I mean, notable mention to our little bird there, the OG of uh, uh, language models. <coughs> uh, so while sort of picking up a model uh, for your applications, there are certain key uh, considerations. Uh, like, why do you need like a large language model for your application? Uh, and basically, which sort of pre-trained model is something that aligns with your goals uh, of, of your uh, application and your customers? And then uh, accuracy requirements, uh, you do multiple evaluations and benchmarks uh, to arrive, the, uh, arrive at the right model that you would sort of use in your uh, you know, uh, downstream application. And then uh, also something that uh, you would take care is basically the financial investment. This is both in terms of deploying, deploying these models or in terms of using these models via an API. Uh, how much tokens are you paying uh, based on your user base uh, and based on the provider. And then uh, purpose and licensing. Obviously, if you're using like an open weight model or an open source model, you have to sort of take care of the proprietary uh, licenses uh, to you know uh, use in your uh, applications. So uh, how how are LLM sort of deployed uh, uh, today? Uh, so so you basically have this uh, you know very high level architecture. Uh, you have your CPU node pool, which is basically taking care of all your, you know, application level of, uh, you know, uh, requests. And then you have the TPU slice nodes, which is basically taking care of the model part. So you're getting your model from probably some sort of a storage and basically you're loading it into the model server and basically then exposing it, uh, you know, via the CPU node pool, which is basically your uh, API gateway. And then you have, you know, all your authentication and load balancing and all uh, part of, of the same engine. Uh, this uh, is a slightly higher uh, level now when you talk about deploying using such deployed models in your applications. For example, RAG, uh, a very famous architecture framework. So in this case, basically you have your data systems, subsystems and your uh, serving subsystems. Uh, wherein basically you would have your LLM inference stack uh, at the bottom and basically, you know, you would sort of build all the front end, uh, you know, uh, part of, of the application. Uh, and basically you would ha also have a vector database, which is basically for all your semantic search and, you know, storing your embeddings and all. So uh, now uh, in terms of uh, limitations, now uh, obviously large language models, they are pretty large. So there are a lot of limitations in terms of using these models uh, in a customer facing application. Uh, first and foremost is latency. Uh, you know, obviously these are cloud based models and you know, uh, it sort of, uh, you know, get impacted in, in your real time applications. If you're sort of building, let's say a search engine and if it, it takes, uh, you know, 10 seconds to sort of load the search results, then it's bad, bad user experience. Uh, cost, obviously, as I mentioned in the previous slides, significant cost in terms of both deployment as well as using them uh, via an API. Privacy concerns, uh, I think this, uh, I mean, we have seen a lot of uh, news articles recently and as well as in the past of, uh, you know, security breaches and, you know, prompt hacking and all those sort of things where, you know, customer data, user data has been sort of, uh, you know, taken into the model and basically used for training uh, newer models. <clears throat> and uh, also there is a dependency on internet connectivity because everything you're using via an API. Uh, so you have, you need to have an internet connectivity. 
so let's say if you are uh, in a in a flight or basically you have you are in in an area where you have uh, low or no internet connectivity these models are difficult to access and then scalability challenges are obviously there as i mentioned like you know if if your customer base sort of starts in, in uh, using your application at a higher scale then probably you know uh, you know your latency would sort of increase and there might be uh, scalability issues in in the long run so what brings us to the next part is basically you have small la uh, language models uh, now what are small language models obviously the name suggests they're small uh, now the small uh, refers to the uh, to the number of parameters that the model has uh, as compared to the large language models uh, as well as the data that it's trained on so they can have like a few hundred million parameters to uh, a, bil uh, a, bil a few billion parameters and then uh, like this is just to summarize if uh, LLMs are like Wikipedia, SLM is like your pocket dictionary. Uh, it's portable, efficient, and it's very specialized. Uh, this is just to, I'm not sure if this is visible on the slide, but uh, this is just to sort of, uh, uh, sort of showcase uh, the landscape of, uh, the current landscape of uh, small language models that we have. So on the y-axis you have uh, the number of parameters in billion and on the bottom you have your uh, release date. So um, like the latest models that you have uh, from Meta and Google and uh, Microsoft. So uh, there is a lot of evolution coming, uh, uh, you know, in, in this space and a lot of models are being launched uh, every, every month. Uh, now, in talk, talking terms of uh, the advantages, so uh, obviously, as I mentioned, uh, SLMs give you that uh, tailored uh, efficiency and precision for your task, uh, for your workloads, uh, as compared to uh, a general purpose LLM. Uh, speed, obviously, because they are small, so it will take less time to sort of process a request and sort of serve it to, to, to let's say, your customers. And cost, obviously, you know, uh, it's, it's a smaller model. You can sort of probably fit it in one GPU or, you know, multi or just a bunch of GPUs and you can sort of easily deploy on your own in your cloud instance and sort of start, uh, you know, uh, uh, using it or serving it. Uh, so just giving one, one example um, of, of an SLM. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is Gemma. Uh, I'm from Google, so I have to talk about Gemma, sorry. <laughs> uh, so uh, Gemma uh, is, a, is a family of lightweight uh, open models. Uh, it's built from the same technology as uh, Google Gemini. And uh, the flavors that Gemma offers is basically uh, the, these five. Uh, so you have your base Gemma model, which you can use for your text generation tasks. You have a lot of variants in that, uh, 2 billion model, 2 billion instruction tuned, 7 billion uh, 9 billion, 27 billion, etc. Then for code generation, you have code Gemma. Recurrent Gemma is something that uses uh, RNNs uh, as, as a hybrid architecture, and it sort of gives you faster inference as compared to, uh, you know, a normal uh, Gemma model. Then you have a vision open model also, uh, which is Pali Gemma. It's 3 billion. It's a smaller model, so you can use for image Q&A or, you know, captioning and all. And then you have a task specific model like Shield Gemma, which is specific for you know safety purposes. So you can use this as part of your workload if you want to sort of uh, filter out uh, inappropriate responses, etc., uh, in in your in your entire LLM workflow. So yes, um, we are excited to use SLMs, uh, but uh, you know how can SLMs function? With, with fewer parameters. Um, so obviously, uh, it comes down to, to the training methods, uh, be it transfer learning or distillation or fine tuning that is basically used to sort of make these models more task specific. Uh, domain specific adaptation, that is where fine tuning sort of comes into picture and techniques like LoRa, QLoRa or Dora, something like that is sort of used to make sure that uh, for your uh, you know domain, uh, the language understands the nuances and the style adaptation. And then effectiveness, obviously, it depends on the entire uh, pre-training pre and fine-tuning. Uh, and, and this is just to highlight uh, one example of, let's say you have a query and you have an intelligent uh, LLM query router, and then you can have smaller uh, SLMs. 
uh, which probably can fit in into your your infra infrastructure and then basically based on you, you know uh, the the query you can sort of uh, use a specific llm so for example um, you have an slm to just summarize uh, a conversation you don't need a large language model there so you can have a very uh, you know uh, domain specific slm fine tuned on your data on your style of uh, you know responses that you want and then it sort of does the job at uh, lower cost and lower compute uh, this is the last slide from my perspective uh, before i hand over so just you know whatever i spoke about just putting some uh, high level you know uh, stages of how uh, an slm is trained and then sort of uh, fine tuned for for a specific uh, you know task so uh, <clears throat> now that we've seen about you know what are large language models and you know the evolution of slms now uh, joiner will sort of talk about running these models on device hello hello uh, yeah thanks nikhil uh, i think so far what we discussed was what are slms how do you use it the benefits you get right and yesterday if some of you were in our talk we talked about how deploying this model in the cloud is a pain or because of the gpu availability uh, you know uh, maintaining the large infrastructure which required to stop, deploy this large model set right? and yeah and the second part is uh uh internet connectivity or access to these models are a challenge i think i'll start with a demo first before i go to uh, you know uh and use case first i don't know i think i flew down from bangalore here i opened chat.openai.ai and while well, it's not accessible to me right i cannot access uh these uh, tools for me to work right luckily i had uh, this deployed for me in my laptop and is the same right if i can i can just do this right so if i just turn down my and hope uh, demo gods are with me today uh yeah so if you see i'm giving this a random code saying okay this is write this in python and and explain to me right and uh this is all the model is running locally for me to now uh give me the response right imagine a situation where you know you need to access to customers or your actual users who don't have internet right who are in a very uh, remote location where they cannot connect to your cloud deployments to run these slms to get the responses you can still uh, build products for them at their site right uh imagine uh, use cases like disaster management uh, you know things like farm uh, helping the farmers <laughs> or or helping those remote locations where you don't have connectivity as well as you don't have the compute availability right uh and again uh, from from an uh, company perspective you are also saving a lot of cost right? you're offloading your infrastructure to the user itself you are using the use their infra their phone their laptop their machines to run your models and then uh, you know uh, build your product around that right uh, other thing it's not just text what we can also do is if i just load this whisper model right i could say write a code in python to add two numbers yeah and then it's all, everything is a voice model the the, uh, the llm which is powering the the inference and everything is running locally on the device itself right on the machine itself uh yeah so now let's go ahead and see how this is done right how you are able to do it so essentially these are three steps right uh, you take an llm from or an slm from your research team or anywhere from the cloud uh, from which are released and the next thing is optimize right so this is very important step right how do you now optimize that memory make it small uh, the llm to make it small so that it can now run in this edge devices right? which is where converting an llm to an slm is happening right but you can also optimize further the slm to a size where now you can run in your laptops in your phones right and then finally you go ahead and deploy uh, so these are three uh, three or four steps right essentially three steps right to start with uh you take a pretend slm authored in pytorch tensorflow any of your languages you go ahead and now do on device optimization right uh you would do things like quantization graph pruning and a lot of this right we're not going to details of that potentially you are uh, pruning uh, shrinking the model to now use lesser memory now use uh, lesser compute and also give you the responses faster right uh now once you have that what you do is now package the model into a binary which can now be deployed uh in your edge devices right so in this case uh, we'll use uh, wasm web assembly to now help us to deploy this to end customers and users so that it's like it's like docker for the cloud right so, so sorry docker for the web right so i can write it once and uh, run it anywhere i want 
so the the secret sauce is wasm along with uh, webassembler media pipe so media pipe is an open source project cloud prof, uh, cloud platform project for you to now deploy uh, any of your ml based uh, workloads right be it mobile web desktop embedded applications uh, most of us might have used uh, google meets right uh, the background uh, the feature that changes your background that uses this technology right so that uses this to remove a background on your device before it ships uh, sends your video feed to your the other person on the other side right and it provides a very low code no code way to build deploy those packages uh, essentially this right and it's not only llm or image right you could do things like bose estimation uh, voice classification speech to text text to speech and all of these scenarios all with uh, media pipe right uh, while media pipe was there uh, they were not able to run um, uh, llms slms in a way uh, till they integrated uh, something called as wasi nn right uh, so wasm was already there but wasi nn was an extension from wasm which now allows them to uh, you know run this uh, ml inference right in existing uh, uh, models and frameworks which also increases the performance right for things like uh, i think they use xnn pack and other things to accelerate the performance uh, you could run these models in sims gpus tpus fpgas or which were written in various frameworks right as a flow on x of nvino and what not so it looks something like this right so you have your wasi nn on top which now has the ml backends to uh, infer what is written in the model how to run it and then at the end it has it can you can have cpu gpu gpus whichever is available to now access them and <coughs> run your workloads there uh, yeah so this is a process right so you start with an uh, model example mobile net you now take that uh, and convert them into a mobile net or wasm file that a mobile net uh, wasm container which now allows you to run this container anywhere in the world right uh, and this container essentially you can ship your native code right be it rust python c++ which can now run in that uh, browser environment and then uh, in the in the deployment side essentially your web page just loads this wasm file which can now talk to your web gpu runtime and run these ml applications on your uh, machine uh, yeah so essentially if you uh, a simpler architecture is this that you have a model which is in tensorflow js or next runtime media pipe which now might have a js component for you to now inference or talk to that model right and then there was a container which has the model itself and then internally it talks to if a gpu is available well and good for example max they have gpu cpu combined right so it talks to that to accelerate your performance and give you back if it if it doesn't have a gpu it will default to cpu to still give you the performance or still give you the output uh, yeah a typical scenario right let's say when you are building something right this is how it looks right so uh, essentially you will collect the user data go ahead do a model training uh, then uh, uh, build a model maybe make it available via firebase or any other web distribution platform for you to now do over the air deployments right on your mobile you will have this on device container which runs uh, wasm and then this just checks if a model is available from the cloud downloads it make it available lo locally and then whenever a user gives the request it is running everything locally to give the response out uh, yeah so first let's say you have a model right uh, you have a model uh, first this is if you have a native model right for example if a model which is just trained you can directly just call uh, converted or conversion config to now convert that model in a format dot, dot, in a dot bin format which can now run uh, in your uh, uh, like media wipe can now uh, understand and, and, and run that right if you let's say you don't have used the base model but you are fine tuning it right you, are, you might be using lora right so what you just do have to do is you have to say okay this is my lora config this is my lora checkpoint uh, this is a tf light file that I want to adapt it to. Now it can add everything together and give you a .bin file, which can be now used to uh, run the model. Uh, and then once your model is available, you just do bundler dot bundle config to now uh, bundle that model into a wasm container. Uh, sorry, a model file which can now the like wasm container can use to run that model uh, wherever you want, right? Uh, and, and this is how your pipeline looks like, right? So you would use something like as a wasm and media pipe together to allow you to run this. On top of that, the ML inference itself is accelerated by XNN pack, right? And SLMs, you could use Gamma and any other models. Uh, if we look at here, right? 
something like this. So this is all uh, the code you have to do. If you're, if you're using something out of the box, right, that's all you have to do, right? You just have to create a JS file. Uh, there you'd say, okay, this is the media pipe task container I want to use. Maybe if it's not visible. Yeah. So you would just add this, right? You just add uh, task in a container to say, okay, I'm going to use uh, this container. And then what you do is, uh, yeah, you now, uh, from options, from the file set, you are loading that mem model into the memory, right? And then you, same parameters, right? Max tokens, top K temperatures, and whatever. Uh, then basically what you do is, you now start inferring, right? So whenever you come, you just uh, call this to now generate more tokens for you. And as the tokens are being generated, you are uh, displaying them on the user, right? A simple web app just with this, and then I have an HTML to just take the input and uh, show the output to the user, right? Uh, a simple application of this, right? So as you see, as I am loading, uh, this is downloading the bin file, right? It has downloaded the bin file on the browser itself, and then it is running everything there, right? And I could ask like, So if you see the speed, right? Uh, it is everything running locally. You are you essentially don't see any latency, any performance issues, right? It entirely depends on the compute that you have. Right? Yes, the performance might vary if you have a high-end machine versus a phone versus it, it varies. But again, the the performance across uh, is still better than connecting to cloud and getting the response back. Right? Uh, and then this is what, right? So there are two things that we are tracking here, right? We're not tracking uh, things like max uh, end to end latency, but two things we're tracking is prefill performance and decode performance. Uh, prefill performance, basically, whenever I give an input, how much time the model takes to process that and process that, right? And if you see here, it is under 600, uh, uh, like 600 tokens per uh, second, right? Is the speed at which it can work. And at the same time, decode performance is, okay, I have given a prompt, how much time the model takes to now give me response, right? It is around, as average is around 25 tokens per uh, second is, and that's, that's more than human readable speed, right? I cannot read 25 seconds in a, uh, 25 tokens in a uh, second altogether, right? Uh, yeah, and the second is now, okay, you have deployed, uh, you, you explored deploying Eton or Web devices. What if I want to deploy it in edge devices, right? Let's say uh, in FPGAs or your Raspberry Pi boots, or things like this, right? So, which is where we have was a major runtime, right? And it's the same, right? You just download the container, uh, and this is just three steps for you to now be able to download this and run it, right? I think uh, Second State has a booth outside where they are demoing this and looking at how you can run this, right? So, all you do is uh, same. You just download the LLM chat wasm container. And then you pass in the model file, right? Meta LLM instruct GGUF. So GGUF is a format which allows you to now run this. And then you just run, right? Uh, you you start preloading it, and then you can just talk to it, give your inputs, and it will start giving output. So imagine end user terminals, which are very low compute, smaller uh, things like Jetson Nano boots, things like uh, Raspberry Pi boots, or even I think uh, day before yesterday, Google has launched for you to allow to run it in a serverless fashion, right? You could run it in cloud run where you don't essentially need to provision a server to be able to uh, run these, right? Uh, I think yeah, that's all uh, we had, uh, you know, essentially what you are doing is SLMs are making these models smaller uh, and these small models can beat uh, these models in those specific tasks, right? Uh, and I think technologies like MediaPy, Wasm, Edge, Wasm Edge Runtime allows you to increase the adoption, reach those end users, reach those users who don't have those compute uh, or even, even network availability to even use these technologies. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's all. That's all for us. There's some links for you to go ahead and understand this in detail. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Any questions? Yeah, please. Thanks. Uh, this, was, this was a great presentation. Uh, just a quick uh, Thing, the, the link at the end doesn't work. Okay, so, I'll, I'll update Yeah, so <laughs> I love the slides, so I would love a copy of those. And second of all, um, our organization, we don't use stuff like GitHub Copilot because of the 
proprietary yeah. nature of our code. We don't want GitHub to have access to it. Um, would edge deployment of LLMs, uh, for instance, the the code -rated, the code LLM, be useful for a situation like this? And do you yeah, recommend something? Yeah, exactly. Like right. So exactly the this one that you see, right, the demo that I've showed you, right. This is exactly for that, right. For me to able to have access to and copilot, still not sending anything outside, right. I'm right. Not sending anything outside. So second is. Uh, I don't have that link available, but we can chat offline and give you a link. One friend of mine works at Hugging Faces. He created a uh, VS Code plugin. So it takes your code, trains a model in your machine, and then makes it available for you as a VS Code plugin. It's the same copilot experience, but it's on your data, on locally, and everything. Right. right. And so it's uh, trained on your own? Yeah, on your data, on your machine. So nothing is going out. That's great. Yeah, and, let's, and let's chat offline. Yeah. yeah. So you could that. build those technologies. Again, let's say, like how it helps me is. Here I cannot access OpenAI or Gemini, right, because of geography restrictions, but I still have an SLM in the same experience that I can talk to and get my work done. That understands right? and has been trained on your code. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, let's chat about that after this. That's great. Uh, I would like to ask, did you guys have the experience on using the Parallel Drama in the Rap AI? Uh, I see the camera is, is working, but is this how about the multi mode model so to be able to deploy? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Seam Wasm allows you to run not only Polygamma, but things like, uh, uh, you know, DALI, uh, distilled version of DALI, right? For you to generate images in, in these scenarios. And how about the size of the model that you guys have? Is, as, the, as I know, the, the, the size of the model, for, for example, Parallel is is quite large. And I'm not sure about is how much memory the, or the data yeah. for the for the browsers to be able to run a a so-called not very small LLM. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what we have tested so far, right, is uh, at least if you have in your phone around four GB of memory, oh. right, some of these models like Phi three, uh, you know, Gamma two, right, Gamma models run. Yeah. Right. Uh, there are some hardware constraint. Let's say if I'm using on browser, right. I cannot, uh, low, uh, I think, have more than 500 MB of cache, right? I cannot save that large model in cache. So where I have to maybe save it in uh, the, the disk of the machine to now read it from there, right? So there are some um, ways for like tweaks you have to do to get it done, right? Second is if you are doing building an iOS app, right? Oh. Uh, iOS natively doesn't allow any model more than size of 2 GB, right? So it has to be under 2 GB. So Gamma is a very good candidate there because the size, once you quantize it, once you make it available, it's just under 2 GB. Okay, for you to now the deploy. model size. But this, yeah. it's just the compiler, we do the size of the model to to be able to run. Yes, it's yes. So, so, so the size is not exactly from hack and phrase. They are, they are for Python and, and I think it's more, uh, is this? Yeah, so this step, right? This step. Convert, yeah, this step, right? So this step also allows you to shrink the size, right? So you do, uh, things like we see uh, this checkpoint formatting, right? So you can say, okay, I want an int eight model, right? Mm. Instead of float sixteen, I want an int eight. So that conversion makes this model smaller. Yes, there will be some performance loss, right? But you will have to overcome. Uh, basically, you will have to, uh, five to ten percent of performance loss because you are doing a low precision compute. But okay. still, you can do the same thing get, getting done. And also the, about the loading time, the, is the model gets larger? Is yeah, yeah. It, it depends on the internet, right? If the model, the file is large. Uh, you'll still need to download the container in the browser, right? So that is a bit uh, high time. Oh, but suppose you're able to cache it in the browser. As for my use case, maybe the different different websites may may want to share the same model. For example, yeah. oh, part, load the paradigm is there, and then they go to different website, and then we use the the model. Um, but as I know, at this moment, the cache is something like browser cache. Yeah, so browser cache, uh, let's say Chrome or Firefox, they don't allow more than 500 MB of cache. Okay. So you have to write in your local storage and then read it from there. Oh, okay, okay, okay thank you. <laughs> but yeah. but uh, this is about the caching issue. Is the model is getting larger, is it able yeah. to be used for different websites, uh, it will be great as the yeah. first time, maybe maybe even built in into Chrome later, uh, we can install yeah. the plugin and then download some model from extension and then keep it in extension. Yeah, so, uh, so the, the, there is uh, there is something called a Gemini Nano that is uh, now being released as part of Chrome as as, as a uh, yeah. inbuilt Chrome uh, you know a feature uh, that will sort of enable you to sort of use this without uh, loading the model. But that is like very specific models that 
I mean, you can't, it's basically Google proprietary models that you will use as part of Chrome uh, mm -hmm. as, as a product. Here, you can use sort of any open model which you can sort of fit in your uh, hardware or infrastructure. And also, uh, there are other uh, vision models uh, previous to Palijama, like you can go to TensorFlow Hub and sort of look at MobileNet and all small models. Depends on your uh, task specific, let's say you want to uh, sort of do if just image captioning. Uh, you know, you can sort of use those models as well. They are they're smaller in size, not as big as Palijam. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any last questions? I think we have four minutes. Thank you.